All right, let's get started. Good morning. It's, uh, I don't know if there's anything symbiotic about today's date, uh, 5 2020. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of tired of hearing about 2020. But uh, anyhow, welcome. We're glad you could find time in your schedule to join us today. I'm Jim Marshall. That's Clint Babcock. Catherine is behind the controls here, making it all happen. Thank you, Catherine. So we've been talking all, over the last six, eight weeks a lot about how to get along and kind of adjust during this pandemic, how we need to change behaviors, attitudes, techniques. We think, we got to talking about it the other day, and we think the time is, is well past for us to put our foot back on the accelerator and move forward. How do we go about getting back to the business at hand, growing our business, growing our, building our pipeline, growing our prospect base by doing what got us here in the first place? Now, you might need to do things a little bit differently. We're gonna talk about that today, but we think it's time to kind of focus on not so much getting the economy going, but getting your economy going again, building your prospect base, doing the behavior. So we're gonna talk about some of that stuff today. There's been lots going on in the last 60 days. First of all, we're gonna ask you to participate in this session because we're gonna need your feedback as we go forward. So you're gonna be a critical part of this. So what's been going on? Well, the last 60 days, we know that your people have been dealing with lots of things. Um, maybe you, maybe some of the people that work with you, maybe with people in your office. Uh, there's been a lot going on in terms of news reporting, financial uncertainty, insecurity, lack of clarity, social media, negative conversations with coworkers and friends and family, leading to stress, of course. Maybe there's been some health issues, hopefully nothing serious, but you know what? It does take its physical toll, a lack of exercise, uh, maybe binge eating and drinking. We talked last mm -hmm. week about the COVID-15. Some of us are experiencing that. Is this a bad thing? Well, it's not a bad thing, but it might have been more than that, All okay? Right. Okay, all right. And money is tight. So what do we need to focus on? Here's what we'd like you to examine. What have you learned over the last 60 days? What aha moments have you had? How do you go about rebooting your business? What do you need to focus on in the next 30, 60, 90 days? How do you get back on the radar of your clients and your customers and your prospects? They have been preoccupied. How do you become top of mind for them? And what do we need to do differently? We need to do different things, but some of the things we're doing, we need to do those differently. So let's dive in. We're gonna share with you a couple of ideas and approaches that might be familiar to some of you, but it's a good refresh and it's a good reminder that we really do need to get back to the basics. So. So open up your chat and, um, and, and st let's start filling this up because we want to make sure as we go across today that we're doing our best to address some of the things that you're having issues with. So take a moment, take a look at what's on your screen. Hey, I can be more effective at building my pipeline, closing more businesses, only I could what? And uh, we're gonna have Catherine read some of these off as they start coming in, because as we're going through today, our, our hope and our goal are be able to tie back what we're gonna talk about to some of the biggest issues and challenges that you have. Uh, so, so take a minute, and as these start coming through, we're gonna, we're gonna start um, listing them off. So, so they gotta complete that sentence. I could be more got? effective at building my pipeline and closing more business if only I could do now. It'll, well, we want you to focus on things that you can control. I don't want you to say that you could be more effective at closing more business if um, somebody finds a cure for COVID-19. Well. Oh, get back to comfort level to bond and rapport. Yep. Okay, we're going to definitely talk about that. Ah, good one. Okay. Prospecting head traffic. There's a few on there that say, find my clients again, too, Clint and Jim. Okay. Okay. All right. Get directly to the prospects. Get directly to the prospects. Yeah, interesting. Okay, at what point are you even going to be invited in to have meetings with prospects again, right? And getting more and more comfortable. Uh, one of the things we hear a lot is getting more and more comfortable inviting people to, uh, to having video conferences. Good. Okay. 
All right, so let us give you a snapshot of what are some of the things that, uh, that as Jim and I were preparing for this, some of the things that we've been hearing from, uh, from our clients and prospects. So um, here's some of the typical responses, right? You know, here's, let me, let me spend a moment on this. Not reaching decision makers, and this, this just doesn't mean that you're not doing the activity behaviors, you probably are, but here's what's different. You're hearing a different kind of uh, stall or objection based upon the level that you are calling in at. So if you're not reaching decision makers, if you're reaching people lower within an organization, the stalls and objections you're hearing are always gonna be tied to budget, money. Hey, we don't have the ability to do that. If you're hearing that, there's probably a pretty good chance you're not at the right level within the organization. So be thinking about what am I hearing? And because senior level executives, people that are higher up, won't hide behind the budget conversation because if it's good for their business, they'll go out and they'll find the money no matter where they are because they're still spending money. They just got priorities around that. We got to figure out where we fit in that. Next is, um, is, is being ghosted. Look, um, Here's what I can share with you. Being ghosted, the first thing you got to do is look at yourself and go, what did I do in order to cause this? It is 95% of the time you did something that caused them to ghost you. And here's typically what it is. You left your prospect off your calendar. Your prospect got off your calendar. You ended a meeting. You did not set that next meeting of what was going to happen and what the criteria and what's important to have be discussed at that next meeting. It's usually a self-inflicted wound that happens. So be thinking about this. If I came into your office right now and opened up your calendar, would I be able to see over the next week or two or three, all of the prospects that you have meetings for on your calendar, or are you in follow-up mode? So we're gonna talk a little bit about how to make sure you keep that, keep that awareness and that pain on their calendar in front of them. Uh, think it overs. Think it overs is really a uh, is really a stall and objection that if if you're taking that it's you, you, you're not asking that next question of hey when somebody says think it over it usually means one or two things and being able to articulate what typically that means and it could be that they've thought it over they don't want to move forward they're just nice people and they don't want to let you know dealing with difficult people so this is where um, we spend a lot of time in our bonding report we're going to touch about today around um, emotional composure and how to make sure that we understand how to take somebody through when they're difficult, how to handle that scenario and that situation. I'm going to touch on that in probably about five, 10 minutes when we get to that part. And then worrying about price. The last one of the last sessions we did was uh, on negotiations and, uh, and making sure that we're not um, allowing COVID-19 to become a liability to our margins and to our pricing that we're doing. Uh, so, so making sure that we're keeping the focus on their situation and not diving down to the bottom of our margins and doing skinny deals that's going to hurt our cash flow in the third and fourth quarter of this year. And then, of course, um, creating proposals that, that don't go anywhere. You'll, you're going to see today, we're going to lay out you know, part of the Sandler process and the system to make sure that when you get to that point of a proposal, you've got a good understanding and a really good chance of making sure that that's gonna come through. One of our big mantras, qualify hard, close easy. And one of the things we try to embed into the mindset of our salespeople is how much does it cost you to put a proposal together and to make sure that by the time you get to that point, it's absolutely well worth the time and energy and effort to do it instead of moving the proposal process up way too far and way too fast. Another one that somebody put in the chat box there, Clint, was um, time management and improving behaviors, okay. which is something we hear about all the time. Uh, and my question to that, my response to that, is it time management or is it task prioritization? We all have the same number of hours in the day. How do we prioritize those tasks? So Actually, I'd add to that, I would say goal. Yeah. Anytime somebody blames something to me on time management, my first reaction is that's BS. Um, you know, and, and I'll soften that up a little bit to the right person, but some of you need to be told that's BS. It's because you haven't set the right goals, therefore set the right prioritization, mm -hmm. and now you don't have that excuse of time management. Right. And the 
great example I've always got is, hey, did you brush your teeth this morning? Well, it was that a goal and a priority? Uh, hopefully you did. <laughs> and that just means that you made the time for it. I forgot to do it. something. Is that what you forgot I to forgot do? I forgot to do that, yeah. yeah. Time blocking, sure. Okay. Okay. All right. All right, so a couple things just mindset-wise. So when we say, hey, you have the right to, you're going to hear this, uh, this, this saying from us, equal business stature, the right to be able to have the mindset to do certain things. So Jim, as you roll through these, you know, take control. We're going to talk about making sure that you understand the dance that happens between the buyers and sellers and who needs to be in control. And just, and just understand, it's, sometimes I think we make it complicated. Sometimes I think as, as salespeople, we get in our own way. And if we don't have a path, the problem is we end up wimping out to the buyer's path and not knowing what a successful sales process looks like and knowing that, hey, if I stay on my plan, my process, and if the buyer moves along with me on that, then we're in, we're in good shape. If at any point in time, things start to exhibit themselves of, of, of opposite of that, well, whenever I've seen that process, it usually doesn't end up in a close or a good sale either way. So one of the things we want you to make sure is you've got your process, you follow it diligently, and you recognize really quickly with buyers that don't seem to follow that successful path. So you're going to hear a couple of things today that uh, might strike you as a little different. They might strike you as counterintuitive. They might even strike you as a little bit, um, I don't want to say jarring, but it's going to cause you to stop and think. And here's one of them. Most roadblocks, stalls, and objections you face have evolved from interactions with the buyer and are not necessarily tied to any particular facet of your product or service. So in other words, it has nothing to do with your features and benefits. It all has to do more often than not with how you interact with your buyer and your prospects. So we're gonna spend some time talking about that today. Here's a challenge for you. Take a look at the screen and what we would like you to do is, as a seller, all these are steps that are involved in the seller's process. How would you put those in order? What order would you put those? Step A, step B, step C, step D, step E. Do you start with uh, presenting? Do you start with uh, maybe handling objections before they even occur? There is a process that we follow as sellers whether we're conscious of it or not, maybe these are things that somebody taught us. These are some things that maybe we learned down through time. And maybe these are things that just kind of, we, we reinforce them by continuously doing the same thing over and over. Here's what that looks like. Typical seller order is this. And I want you to think about this in the context of you coming across a prospect that has agreed to have a conversation with you. What is your process? This is typical. We start with a needs analysis. So tell me about your business. Tell me about your company. Uh, how can I help you? What is it you're looking for? Now, the prospect or the buyer starts giving you signals. They start giving you interest. They start giving you buying clues. They say, well, we're really interested in this. We, we want to look about the solutions for that. We take those to be buying signals, fake interest, fake buying signals, and we automatically go into presentation mode. Well, let me show you what we got. Let me tell you how we fix that. So now the buyer is feigning interest. They're saying, oh, that's very interesting. Tell me more about that. We take that as genuine interest to do business with you. We go for the close. The buyer says, well, wait a second, not so fast. I'm taking other proposals. I'm just gathering information now. I'm not ready to buy. Call me back next week. So what do we do? We follow up, we follow up, we follow up, we follow up. So I, I share the story sometimes about when I was buying some fencing once upon a time, and I told uh, the prospect that I wasn't ready to buy. That was two years ago, and he's still following up with me. Every 45 days, I get a call. You ready to move forward on that fencing? We get constantly caught up in that follow-up mold, uh, that mode with people that have no interest in doing business with us. Are you ghosting the fence guy? I am. I'm ghosting the fence guy. <laughs> All right. So um, put your buyer's hat on for a second. Put your, think about you as a buyer. And then uh, think about, all right, how would I grade myself as a buyer? 
Uh, I'll be the first to admit, I'm not a really good buyer. Why? Because I'm dealing with a salesperson and I find myself trying to rescue the heck out of them and go, look, you're not asking me the right questions. You're not doing this. Look, I'm trying to buy. Would you just get out of your own damn way? Right? So, so one of the things that, that when you think about the process of the buyer, put your hat on for a second and, and now put this in order. Because when Sandler first started researching around the psychology of the buyer and of salespeople, he spent more time dealing with the psychology of the buyer to try to understand him or her and what that process is than he did trying to deal with the psychology of the salesperson, right? Hey, where are we going to focus first? What is the buyer's system and what are we dealing with? So as you take a moment and you think about the buyers you have in your prospect pipeline right now, where are they in their system and in their process? Some of you work with, with small to medium-sized companies that may or may not have a buying process. Others of you work with medium to enterprise large companies that have a very distinct process. And have you taken that and mapped that out on how that company and that individual buys? So when you take a look at this and such, and now you go, okay, let's put this in an order. So stack, you know, take a look at this put this in an order. Well, this happens first, this happens second and such so that you can kind of know where your buyer is in that process. So if you look at your pipeline right now, you got to be able to identify, oh, this is where my buyer is. So take a look at the order on what typically happens, right? So this is a typical order. They express some interest, whether it's a lead, whether it's a cold call that you made that said, yeah, hey, come on and talk to me. Now comes the motivation, right? Yeah, hey, maybe they do have an interest or a need and they want to find out more. And this is what we got to watch out for. This is where all of a sudden they start asking too soon, too early, hey, can you put a proposal together for me? How would you do this? How would you do that? And you find yourself starting to give up more and more information. Now think about your buyers that start to get to that point where they're about ready to, to ghost you or they start to not showing up and have zero commitments along the way. So when you start recognizing that they're avoiding any kind of commitments to get back together, to sponsor you to have another meeting with one of the other decision makers, when you start seeing that, you start seeing this buying process taking place where you gotta be thinking, all right, are we going down the right path? Because where we don't want to end up is that disappearing, that being ghosted, and us looking back and going, wow, we had some really good meetings. And now all of a sudden, they're not, they're not even in your pipeline anymore. So take a look, map out the kind of buyers you work with and you deal with, because if you do that, Jim, next. Well, hang on. So one thing, if we want evidence of this, Clint, mm -hmm. of the buyer process, if you want evidence and proof of this, all you need to do is look in the mirror because as buyers, we do this all the time. Well, we express what, interest. That's what you did to the fence guy. Yeah, uh, yeah like it, exactly. Right? We express interest. I act yeah. motivated. Yeah, I want to do this. I get the information. They take all the information. Mm -hmm. I don't want any kind of commitment. Let me think about it. And then we disappear. We do it all the time. So why is it a surprise when our prospects do it? All right, so think about how this comes together. The buyer's top, buyer side on, on the top here, and then if we go down the traditional route, we end up bouncing between these. They express interest, we're doing a needs analysis. Oh, they need this, they need that. They're looking for how much of this. We're collecting data there. We're not finding true motivation reasons of why they're gonna buy. And now, of course, what happens they, uh, they act motivated, they want more, give us a proposal, we go ahead and present a proposal. Now, what do they want? Right, they want more information. Here's a real telltale sign, especially some of, uh, some of you that are on that I know work with technology companies. How many times does the first proposal is the one that they go ahead and they move with instead of you having to have two or three or four adjustments and changes to that proposal because maybe all the information wasn't found out up front. So they're getting more information. You try to close, which my sales leaders on the, on the, uh, on the call might try to get people to close things towards the end of the month by offering discounts or, or, or you know, hey, this, this deal is only good till then. 
And now what's happening, they're avoiding the commitment and throwing stalls and objections at you like, hey, we don't have the budgets, we don't have, we don't have the right, right timing, all those kind of things that should have been found out further. You're good at handling objections, you can handle those, and now all of a sudden you find yourself in that chase and follow-up mode that is just exhausting. So if you see this happening, this is the kind of thing that we gotta break and get out of and make sure that we have a stronger process to make sure that we become that, what I call that good to great salesperson. That good to great salesperson is the person that has the ability to disqualify and get opportunities out of their pipeline that just don't belong so they can stay focused on the ones that do. All right, so who's leading this dance? Who's leading this dance? And this is the part where we really want you to get in the mindset, it's your sales call, it's your sales process. We'll have a lot of flexibility along with it, but if you don't know what your process is and where you're heading, that's gonna absolutely put you in the situation where the buyer will lead the process and lead the dance. So what happens when the buyer is in control, right? We end up doing unpaid consulting, we end up getting ghosted and we lengthen our sales cycles. So we got to make sure that uh, we call it the difference between templating your process. You should have a template of the steps that you take a buyer through and the sales methodology that fits within those steps. So if I were to say, hey, what's the typical amount of meetings, amount of conversations and that you have during your sales process, have you taken and templated that out and have been transparent with your prospect through that, especially in the first meeting? At the end of the first meeting, if it's gonna to move to a next meeting, that's a perfect place to be able to say, hey, do you mind if I share with you how we go about this process to help you make the right decision whether we should work together or not? And now being transparent of, hey, the next step includes this, this, and this. And then after that, if we get through that, then the next step includes this. And the final step would be this, whatever that might be. Think about what that template is. And today we're going to show you what the methodology is that fits within that template so that you stay away from this and you can lead them through. Most of the time, not always, but most of the time, your buyers may not be, be, be familiar with buying from you. So they like to know what that process is to be able to buy. And the more transparent you are, the better expectations you're gonna set, the more you're gonna be able to control and lead that dance. So, Jim. So let's talk about a couple of philosophies, a couple of rules, a couple of things that, that we really believe in, partially to avoid this conundrum of free consulting. Um, those of you that are on the call that when you're wearing your buyer hat, you're probably pretty good at obtaining free consulting. As a seller, you got to be on the lookout for that. It doesn't put any money in your pocket. So some of those philosophies are this. Hard selling is good for one thing, hard pushback. If you push and push and push for the sale, you are going to encounter natural resistance. So we're gonna talk about a way of kind of getting out of the way of the sale and let the sale happen, let the sale breathe. The role of the salesperson is to create an atmosphere. This is important. The role of the salesperson is to create an atmosphere, an environment which allows the customer to buy while the salesperson stays out of the way. Get out of the way of the sales process and let it happen. Your responsibility is to tee up that process so that you can kind of sit back and observe and let the buyer or the prospect sell themselves. So we're going to take you through the steps of the selling system. Uh, it has seven elements to it in three parts. Many of you are familiar with this, but uh, some of you, this is going to be kind of new and different. So bear with us, ask questions in the chat box as we take you through it, because you're going to hear some things that might be a little counterintuitive as we go. Feel free to share those with us. All right, so I'm gonna take you through, to, through the first two steps. And the first two steps, if I could, if I could say, here's how this fits together is, is what's that initial conversation? What's the initial three to five minutes of a sales call gonna start and look like? And then how do you continue staying in control right from the get-go and, and all the way through? So step number one, 
if I were to ask, um, if I were to ask and poll a hundred salespeople, hey, what's your number one strength? What's your number one skill set as it relates to being a sales professional? And I do this all the time when I'm in front of new groups. I can guarantee you this: 70, 80 percent of them will go, "Oh, my relationship ability." Okay, great. And then what am I usually doing? I'm diving in that to figure out, well, what do you mean by that? Well, like, well, hey, I just get along with people. I'm a people person. And here's what I know about that. Those people only tend to rely on the art of the sale. If they can build a good relationship with somebody, then that's what they'll be able to do. And maybe they'll get a sale out of it. But they don't understand the psychology and the deeper part about being able to connect with people. So when we talk about this and, and say, look, how do you connect with another person? The big thing that comes to mind is commonality. And then you all know mirroring and matching, being a chameleon. But then once we start getting underneath that, people don't know necessarily how to do it. So there's three primary ways we drill down into mirroring and matching and that commonality. First way is this, it's under a body of knowledge called NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. Let me ask you this, how good are you at reading other people? How good are you when you meet somebody? What do you study about them? What do you see in their, their facial expressions, their body language, their movement, their tonality? How do you look at an individual and go, all right, I'm starting to map you out. I'm starting to understand your cadence, how you think, and I'm starting to pick up the words that you choose to use during our time in our conversation. It's kind of like it would be great if you could watch a sales call from kind of like the uh, interrogation room in a police department, right? And you're the one behind the camera and you get a chance to watch that, 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 that suspect, so to speak, and study what's their facial movements. What are you noticing about that person? That's the same thing we got to do when we first meet somebody in order to pick up, can we mirror and match and connect with that person? Second way is understanding emotional intelligence, emotional quotients. Emotional quotient, if you're not familiar with this, this is something you're gonna to wanna to research and really dive into. It's your ability to A, understand your emotions and how you control those during any times of stress or any time of communication. And secondly, are you able to pick up where somebody else is emotional? Emotionally wise, here's, here's a big example. Think of somebody in your world that you know that has zero self-awareness. I mean, absolutely zero self-awareness when you know, no filter whatsoever, has no idea, you know, and, and you're all probably thinking of that person, maybe it's a cousin or an uncle or an aunt or something like that. I want you to be thinking about that person because that would be the exact person that has zero emotional intelligence. They just don't know how they inter interact and affect other people our ability to be able to connect with somebody emotionally and see where they are and meet them there is an underlying way of making sure that, hey, I can understand their pains, their issues, their problems, and how they're dealing with this. During right now, COVID-19, the, all the things that Jim put up there around stress and negative feelings and such, those are the things we got to really be aware of that's going to spike up our empathy to be able to meet that person where they are. And then the third way is understanding their communication style. Um, those of you that are around us, you know we're big believers and we teach DISC, understanding D-I-S-C communication styles, because you cannot communicate with other people in your normal way. You've got to be able to adjust to the Ds, which are the, the dominant, the be brief, be bright, be gone folks and understand that they are a business bonder and you can bond with them big time over industry understanding and, and background around, around you know, what do they know about the business and the industry. They're going to bond all day long about that, but not necessarily they're going to bond about what's happening this, this uh, upcoming day, upcoming Memorial Day weekend. Then you've got your eyes, your influencers. These are the folks that uh, are, are true people pleasers, right? They're collaborative people. They are positive, upbeat. And you've got to be able to understand that that person is going to have a hard time making a decision. You've got to make sure you involve all the other right people because they want to keep everything positive and upbeat. And if you're an eye, 
If you're trying to, uh, to sell somebody, you got to be able to make that adjustment that you're willing to go deeper into pain instead of keeping everything positive. S's are our steady relators. These are our cool, calm, collected kind of people. When you are selling to an S, you, your number one sales focus is change. S's don't like to change. So you've got to be able to make sure they are comfortable with the risk that might take the place in a change environment because they don't like to take risks. And then last is our C's. These are our analytical, our, our compliance, that they're going to look for data. They're going to look for this to make sense. It's going to be logical. And the C's are going to be the people that are asking the best questions in the room because their mind always wants to know how. So I share a little bit of insights with you around DISC model because A, you got to know yourself and how you communicate. And if you believe in the commonality factor that's important to be able to connect with somebody, we got to be able to identify in the first two or three, four or five minutes, what kind of style of person do I have? And can I make those adjustments in my communication and my style to meet them on where the buyer is going to be? Now, that is going to continue all the way through the sales process. And that's why we start out the Sandler process with buying a report because we all know they probably wouldn't buy from somebody that they don't like, or at least get to the point of where they don't trust what's happening in that communication, which then leads us to this upfront contract. Upfront contract is your first initial move in order to lay out the expectations of what's going to happen during the time you're going to be together. And it's your first move to be able to take control of the sales process. So there's two big things conceptually the upfront contract does. Number one, sets the expectations, which lowers anybody's um, inhibitions to understanding what's going to happen. Think about anything you've gone into and you didn't know what to expect. Your fear factor was up really high. You didn't, you weren't so sure. So you were very hesitant to discuss things or talk about things if you didn't know what was gonna happen. So number one, sets the expectations. And number two, it establishes as an equal business stature. Right up front, if you establish that, you are gonna be treated as such. If you don't, then you end up falling into that category of being treated sometimes like a salesperson. So there's five elements. I'm gonna talk about them just real briefly, just so you have a good understanding. Number one, it's knowing what the purpose of the call is gonna be and making sure that everybody's on the same page. That's probably fairly easy part of it. You've got the meeting, you've shown up, you know why you're gonna meet there. Second is making sure that you're both in alignment on the amount of time that you're going to spend during the meeting. There's not a salesperson around that hasn't showed up to a meeting. You thought you had an hour and uh, you started your meeting and away you went and then 15, 20 minutes into it, maybe the person you were talking to or the power in the room said, uh, hey, you know something, I, I, I got another meeting I got to get to. Hey, great meeting you. And now you just lost the person that you really wanted to make sure you connected with. So it's understanding the time parameters you're going to have in order to accomplish what you want to have done. Next is agenda. Agenda, their agenda. What do they want to get out of the time that you're spending together? Think about if you have a roadmap of what they want to get out, now we've got an easier path for that call. So it's a simple question. Hey, what are the top two or three or four things you want to make sure we spend our time talking about to make it most valuable for you? And for those of you that sell to multiple people in a room, make sure you go one by one, get that down. It may take a little bit of time, but it's going to be so much more valuable to understand their expectations. And then number four, your expectations. In other words, your agenda. What do you want to get out of that meeting? Here's what you want to get out. You want the permission to ask questions. So you want to be able to say, hey, look, I'm real curious about how your company, especially right now, how your company made some adjustments back in March to COVID-19. Uh, you know, I really want to find out where you guys are right now and what are some of the, the initiatives and important priorities. And then if you don't mind, if you could share with me a little bit about maybe third and fourth quarter, what do you see happening then? And that'll give me a really good perspective. Are you okay if I ask you some questions to really uncover how your company has made some adjustments? 
Either way, that's the past, present, future move. But either way, your agenda is going to be about asking questions. So make sure you telegraph to them what kind of questions you want to get out. Now, the last step is called outcome. This is where the equal business stature happens because there are three and only three acceptable outcomes of any meeting. That's it. It's a yes, let's move forward. It's a no, this doesn't fit whatsoever. And it's a clear future. Follow-up is not one of them. Clear future is we've got something set. It's in the books. We know where we're going to go next step. No is self-explanatory, not a fit. Yes is they decided to stroke you a check, give you a credit card purchase order. So this part of the upfront contract is being very disarmingly honest about saying, look, um, you know, through this, one, one or two things might happen. We might determine somewhere through here what you're looking to do just isn't something that we have an area of expertise in. And if that's the case, I'll let you know. On the other hand, if we do think that this is a really good fit, now you've got to know through your template of what's going to happen next. Then we're going to spend the last few minutes talking about setting up the next meeting with some additional people. Uh, it could be if you are in a one call closed sale, it could be, hey, we take a, uh, we take a deposit down and uh, we sign a contract and we get started next week. Whatever that might be, if you're about ready to go in that meeting and if I said, if this meeting goes well, what do you wanna see happen next? That's the yes portion of your upfront contract. So I tell you those elements to make sure that you've, you've got that first initial move of taking control of the sales process. Because if you remember back when Jim was talking about the traditional sales process, it started out with needs analysis. And 90% of the salespeople that I meet when I say, hey, what's your sales process look like? How do you start a meeting? And we role played this brand new people. We go, okay, I want you to go, go ahead. Go the first five minutes of meeting. They go, oh, hey, hello, hey, nice to meet you. Uh, and all of a sudden they go, well, hey, I know you, you guys are looking at, uh, you know, putting new office furniture in. Tell me a little bit about what you're looking for. They go right into the needs analysis. No setup of expectations at all with the upfront contract. So think about how that might change your world to put you in control because otherwise you're going down the same exact path. So that leads us into once we do that, that's the frame up. We call it the first three to five, 10 minutes of a sales call. Now, where are we going to head into the qualification process to make sure that we are taking the mindset of qualification or disqualification, understanding that they're doing it as well. Yeah. And if we don't do that, if we don't start with building the relationship, chances are good the rest of the sales call isn't going to go anywhere. That's why we put it up front, the need to establish the relationship with the prospect and the client and the customer and set the rules of engagement, the rules of the conversation. From there, we have to determine whether the prospect is qualified to do business with us. We spend a lot of time, the amateur salespeople spend a lot of time doing the, the dance, the, uh, the puppy dog dance. <laughs> I hope you like us. They spend a lot of time thinking that they have to qualify themselves in the eyes of the prospect when in actuality, a more productive approach is to determine whether the prospect is qualified to do business with you. Our qualification process consists of three steps. Number one, determining the emotional reason why somebody would want to do business with you. We call it pain. And there's a couple of rules here that you might be uncomfortable with. Number one is that Prospects buy for their reasons, not your reasons. You may think you have the greatest widget in the world and you proceed to go down the path of telling everybody about your features and benefits. Your prospects just don't care. What they do care about is solutions to their problems. The corollary to that is this. You've heard this before. People may make decisions intellectually, but they buy emotionally. Once somebody makes the emotional decision to make a purchase, they'll go back and they will justify it intellectually. I like to ask the question, if you, if you doubt this concept that people make decisions intellectually, but they buy emotionally, go look in your clothes closet. How many pairs of shoes does one person actually need? I need a lot. I know you do. Yeah. But I like the point is, is that it satisfies some sort of an emotional need that we have. We know that human behavior is dictated primarily th three emotions, pleasure, fear, and pain. 
And what we know is that people will go much further out of their way to alleviate pain than they will to acquire pleasure. If you need evidence of that, take a look at the last eight weeks. It may have been uncomfortable practicing social distancing. It may have been inconvenient to stay isolated at home. But the, the pain of potentially contracting that, it, you're going to go much further out of your way to alleviate that than you will to enjoy the pleasures of going out in the public and having dinner in public, and et cetera, et cetera. Understand that people are going to be motivated by avoiding or alleviating pain. So first we have to determine, do they have any pain that we can potentially solve with our product or service? So that's step number one of the qualification process. Number two is, do they have the money with which to afford your solution? Don't know if this describes you, but we see a lot of salespeople that make $5 million presentations and discover after the fact that their prospect has a $500 budget. We have to determine do they have the money to afford your solution? And there's three elements that go into that. Number one, is money available? Do they have money to spend? Number two is, if they don't have it, can they get it? Can they reallocate resources someplace else? And number three is, are they willing to spend it with you? So I have to determine all of those things. And what happens is, in a lot of presentations and a lot of sales situations, we wait to bring price up at the end of the presentation. We go into our features and benefits, we go into our, our presentation, we save the price to the end. We're suggesting you bring up the concept and the idea of money beforehand. One of the ways we avoid free consulting. Let's not give them the price of our solution or product until we determine if they have the money and are they willing to spend it with you. So that's step two. Step three of the qualification process is what we call the decision-making process. So we've got pain, we have budget, we have decision. The decision-making process is exactly that. We have to make sure that we're crystal clear on what their process is for making a decision. And what you need to do is you need to determine five or six data points, five or six pieces of information before you go into presentation mode. And we call it the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Who's involved in making the decision? Many of us find out that, you know what, we think we're presenting to a decision maker. And after the fact, we find out that maybe they've got to run it up the flagpole, or maybe they have to get approval from purchasing. So we have to find out who is involved in that decision-making process. What specifically is the decision they're faced with? What are they deciding? When do they have to make that decision? Where is that decision made? Is it here or is it some decentralized place? Why would they decide to act on your recommendation now versus maintaining the status quo? So we've got the who, what, when, where, why. I believe that perhaps the most important question is how. How are they going to decide whether or not to do business with you? And this is a question for those of us on the call that sometimes I refer to as individuals that are in the proposal writing business. Maybe you're answering bids, maybe you're answering, you're submitting estimates. Here's a question that I want you to really get your arms around and embrace. Suppose that you're submitting a bid or suppose you're answering an RFP and your buyer is collecting three or four different proposals. Before you agree to be part of that process, before you give up your intellectual property to them in the form of a quote or a bid or an estimate or a proposal, ask them this question. Mr. Prospect, I understand you're gathering three or four price points, you're gathering three or four recommendations. Let's play what if. Let's suppose that I leave my presentation with you today. Now I walk out of the office and you have my proposal and the proposal of company A, company B, company C. As you have those proposals spread on the table in front of you, how are you going to decide? How are you gonna decide which one you're gonna go with? Now the answer to that question is gonna be very revealing because chances are they're going to say something like, well, whoever gives me the best deal or whoever provides me with the greatest value or whoever's solution is most affordable. At that point, you're still in control and you can decide whether to pass or play, particularly if you know that your submission is gonna be higher than the others. 
Now you can simply say, Mr. Prospect, I appreciate you sharing that with me. It's good to know that now because chances are, when you see our proposal, we're not gonna be the cheapest. So maybe we should just end the conversation now. That's gonna tell you very quickly where you stand. If in fact they want the cheapest price, the ball is still in your court as to whether you provide it to them or you can walk away. Totally up to you. So those three steps, what is their pain and can I solve it? Do they have the money to afford your solution? And am I crystal clear on the decision-making process? And if you'll notice, what I haven't done yet is given them a price or given them a proposal. Which leads us to the last two steps. But before I get there, let me, let me address this because Jim's right on with the how. Here's, here's the number one problem when you get pipeline creep. Right. Pipeline creep would be, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm predicting it's going to come in this month. And then uh, but that was back in November and you're still waiting it to come in. Happens right here. The decision step uh, out of all of them isn't the hardest. But here's a nice talk track for you on this. Um, Jim covered the how. Let me give you the, the when. Please do not ask this question. Hey, when, when are you looking to make a decision? Right. That's irrelevant. <laughs> Irrelevant because Doesn't who cares matter. when they're looking to make a decision? What they care about and what you care about is when are they looking to implement and solve the pains and the issues and problems that you found here? What's that timeline look like? Now, when you ask that question, you got to study their response. They're going to either be wishy-washy about it. Ah, oh, you know, it could be next month, month after. Then we got to worry about urgency and we might have to go back and find other pain. But if they actually give you a when, well, hey, we want this installed, we want, we want to start working together by, at, by the end of June, please follow that up with, huh, interesting, okay, great, P probably possible, help me to understand why. Why by then? Because we got to see if there's some conviction around that area. And if there is, this is the follow-up question to that. What happens if? So it's, when do you need this in? Why by then? What happens if it's not installed and up? In other words, what's the impact of that not being done, not in place, contracts, whatever that might be? Please take that into account because when you get into the next step of fulfillment, that's going to be so key because when we get there, now we've spent the time and energy and effort of doing all this and our big Sandler rule, qualify hard, close easy. Right? We did the work up front in order to be able to put the proposal together that's going to address the pains that they've got within the budgets that we've discussed and talked about. And now we understand what that time frame and timeline is going to be. So when we get to this, this couple things. One is, first off, hopefully nobody here, and I know we've got a number of our clients on with us today. I know you guys don't do this, but don't ever email your quotes or proposals. Make sure that you've got the person either on the other line, on Zoom, in some way, shape, or form, you're presenting all your quotes and proposals in person. Because what we need to be able to do at the beginning is, hey, review how we've gotten there and make sure that we've got a good understanding of what's gonna happen after we present this proposal because we've covered everything ahead of time. And now we're going to present our solution to the pains that we found earlier. And that has to be in line as you work through there because the next thing we say is, look, you gotta close, not close the whole deal, but you close each of the pains to the solution that you've got. So, hey, based upon what we talked about, you've got issues with this, this, and this. This is what we're going to do in order to work through that and, and, and implement this. Does that make sense? Does that satisfy what you, what you were hoping it was going to do? And as you work your way down through those pains, you're presenting your solutions in that way so that you end up with confirming at the end of your presentation that you've covered everything. Hey, did you miss anything? Do you have it? And that's going to help you stay out of, of any kind of additional scope creep or changes. Doesn't mean it's going to avoid it altogether, but it'll help you get there. I know when I start out my fulfillment or my proposals, I say, look, I, I probably have this probably 85, 90% correct. But as we go through this, there might be something we need to adjust and we need to change 
in order to make sure that this aligns up with everything that we talked about. So as I'm walking them through it, if there's something that needs to be adjusted or changed, boom, I can do it right then and away we go. So that's a very, very easy process. Should be little to no pressure when it comes to presenting what you've got because you've already talked about everything. The reason why we call it fulfillment, you're fulfilling their pains within the budgets and the decision criteria and delivering it to the people that you know are going to be involved. And not always are you going to be in a situation where you're going to get a yes or no then, but you know the time frame and you know because you asked the how question that Jim talked about earlier, they're going to make a decision so that you can stay really, really tight on your pipeline. So now you get an order. You get the, uh, you get the purchase order. You get the, yeah, let's move forward. Our last step is called post-sell. And notice it's post-sell, not post-sale. Sell is a verb, it's an activity, it continues on. So now we enter into that post-selling activity that encompasses uh, first and foremost dealing with buyer's remorse. Some of you are in the business that if they decide to move forward with your company, that means somebody else, an incumbent gets fired. So you gotta make sure that you address that on what's gonna happen, hey, any chance that incumbent could come back and really starts to uh, discuss and talk about, hey, how they're gonna uh, get switch pitched by the, uh, by the incumbent. The other is, um, is dealing with referrals, setting them up to have a referral conversation somewhere down the line when they're happy with what you've got. And then lastly, of course, setting up the expectations of how you're gonna work together and implement the project and stay in touch with them. If there's a shift over to a implementation team, how that's gonna happen and just giving them clarity of now you're a client, this is how we're gonna work together. So that continues on for the life cycle of that client. Jim. So here's some rules. Um, remember all through this, we've been giving you some rules to live by. We will be the first to tell you that this is not easy. This is changing attitude. This is changing behavior. This is changing techniques. Um, but one of the rules is this. You can't sell anything to anybody. We firmly believe that we don't have the ability to handle all the stalls and objections. We can't sell anything to anybody because that's a push technique. The pull technique is to get out of the way and let your prospects discover, let them have that aha moment that they need what you have. So that's a rule. You can't sell anything to anybody until they discover they want it. So now when you take a look at the system, the question is, who's leading the dance now? The whole purpose of the system is to create equal business stature. The golden rule is that he who has the gold makes the rules. Well, the buyer and the prospect has the money. They have certain rights and responsibilities, but guess what? As a seller, as a professional, as the keeper of the keys to the knowledge kingdom, isn't it fair to suspect that you have certain rights and responsibilities as well? The purpose of this system is to level the playing field so that we can have an adult to adult conversation, productive arrival at solutions, and a mutually agreed upon outcome. That's why we do this. So, what we'd like you to do now is just go in the chat room, if you would, and give us a couple of takeaways. What were your lessons learned? What was your big aha? We gave you a bunch of rules. What's the one rule you remember? What's the one thing that struck you saying, you know what, I got to remember that. Maybe it's prospects don't buy features and benefits. Maybe it is we've got to uncover their decision-making process. What's the big aha or big takeaway from you in, in the chat room? Give us a couple, we'll share them with you as we go. I got a quick question here. Can I answer this quick? Sure. All right, um, one of the questions, do you do the upfront contract again in the second meeting? Absolutely, your upfront contract continues along, continues along at the beginning of the first meeting and at the end of the second meeting. And then it goes to the beginning of the second meeting and the end of the second meeting. So really it, it, it does morph and change and adjust. The way that you would do a first upfront contract is going to be slightly different in the second one, uh, especially the outcome portion, because now you're more in a sales cycle. So, so quick answer, absolutely, you sure do. It just makes sure everybody's on the same page and moving in that direction. Well, actually, as you go through the first couple of steps of the sales process, Clint, 
bonding report and upfront contract occur all the way through, all the way through, yep. the, way through the process. Yep. We're constantly building trust, establishing rapport. We're constantly reinforcing the terms of engagement, the rules, and the upfront contracts. Yep. Yeah, we got some questions in the chat room, Catherine? Or learned. No free consulting. No free consulting. Okay. Good. Don't email quotes and proposals, right? Excellent. Those are great. Those are great. Stopping unpaid consulting, understanding prospects buy for their reasons, not your reasons. If you have some sort of an illness, you walk into a doctor's office, is the doctor going to say, well, let me tell you all about the awards I've got. Let me tell you all about my diploma and tell you all about my education. The doctor is going to stop and ask questions and do some discovery. You have to have that same approach. You have to do discovery, ask questions, discover the reasons why they might want to do business with you. So great takeaways, great observations. So we're almost up against our time. If you have any additional problems or questions, feel free to reach out to us. You know where we are. Um, we have uh, offered this in the past and a number of you have taken advantage of it. It's our online learning platform, our e-learning library. It's very easy to log into. So um, if we have any questions, you can reach out to Clint, you can reach out to me, that's our number. We're happy to have those conversations with you. A number of you we deal with on a regular basis. The last thing I'll leave you with is this. You never stop learning. Even though you may know this process, you never stop learning. Repetition, repetition, repetition. It's no different than a golf swing. You may have a golf swing now that's not that productive or not that pretty to look at. It's going to take time and effort for you to change that swing. Some of us are still working on it. But if you think about the top touring pros, who hits more golf balls than anybody? Who practices more than anybody? It's the Dustin Johnsons. It's the Tiger Woods. It's the Rory McIlroy's. These people have already achieved a certain level of success. They never, ever stop learning, stop growing, stop developing, or stop practicing. Now, last thing before, you, before we wrap up and go. Um, some of you that have joined us, uh, your current clients of ours, and uh, hopefully this gave you a, a nice tight overview. Um, others of you that joined us for the first time that uh, you know, found out about this webinar, Here's what I'd like you to do is open up the uh, chat feature and uh, find Catherine's uh, name to send her a private chat. And um, here's what we would just ask, because there's a lot of people, I think there were 60, 70 some people that, that are on here. What I want you to do is put in there um, either, either two words, um, no. No would be, hey, uh, got a lot out of the seminar, but don't really want a follow up call from you. Hopefully it was, it was good, gave you something, but there's no reason for us to uh, reach out to you. And therefore you're helping us save our time and uh, you're helping yourself that we're not giving you a call when you're not looking for one. So please go ahead and just chat to Catherine that, hey, no, you don't wanna hear from us. On the other hand, if you do wanna have a conversation, write in yes. That just means over the next 24 or 48 hours, either Jim or myself or our colleague Eric is gonna reach out to you and have nothing more than a 10, 15, 20 minute minute conversation to uh, see if what we do might help your organization and your company. And uh, we'll work through that and uh, we'll see where that goes. We don't know if we're going to be able to help you or not, but we'll at least start those conversations. So take a moment, put in there privately to Catherine, either no or yes, and uh, we'll make sure that we save that, that chat and uh, reach out to you in the next 24, 48 hours. Jim, any last comments? That's it. Have a great week and have a uh, safe Memorial weekend. Continue to practice social distancing and uh, buy someone a virtual drink. <laughs> All right, guys. Have an awesome week. Call us if you need us. Thank you. See ya.